Chapter 15, Back to Sleep. Speaking of home, the next time Scoop opens his eyes, he seems to be back there. When he arrived, he's not sure, can't say he remembers the return journey, but there are all his most familiar things. Impeccably neat entryway, empty peach bowl on the table. Dad. Scoop smiles. Dad's reclined in his lazy boy with his hands tucked behind his head and his eyes closed, listening to his favorite Smokey Robinson and the Miracles album. This is real music, son. What you know about that? In front of a crackling fire, humming along like he doesn't have a care in the world. Much less a son he hasn't spoken to in days. Nervous, Scoob creeps down the low-lit hallway. Despite Dad's clearly chill demeanor in this moment, Scoob's seen the switch flip before cool, calm, and collected to furious in a matter of moments. Dad's never laid a hand on Scoob before. Doesn't believe in corporal punishment, as he calls it. I taught him that, g once told Scoob. But the ice that rolls off of Dad when he's angry? Well, Scoob hates how small it makes him feel. He stands right in front of the chair. Um, hey, Dad. No response. He doesn't even flinch. Scoop raises his voice a bit. Dad, I'm, I'm back. Dad, nothing. Maybe he's asleep? Scoop steps right up to the chair, his heartbeat thundering in his ears like an angry storm. Hey, Dad. Dad hums for a few seconds, moving his head to in time to the music, and when he stops, he smiles. Scoob takes a deep breath, then gulps, reaches his hand out to touch Dad's shoulder, except his hand never connects with anything solid. Holding it up to his face, Scoob realizes with a start, he can see right through it. Scoob looks down at his arms and torso and legs and feet. Then it's all see-through. He's all see-through. Rushing into the hall bathroom, Scoob flips the light on and looks in the mirror. He doesn't have a reflection, like a ghost. Out the door and around the corner into his room, which doesn't look like his room at all, there's a reddish-brown desk, same mahogany as g treasure box, where his bed should be. Book-filled shelves lined the walls where he'd normally see his superhero posters, instead of his personal treasure chest, which is full of his action figures, Lego sets, and collection of obsolete computer parts Dad has given him. There's a fancy-looking high back chair and ottoman. Scoob rushes to the kitchen to check his personal pantry shelf, the one with his cereals and fruit snacks and the s'mores pop-tarts Dad wishes Scoob wouldn't eat but buys anyways. There's nothing but a box of grape nuts and a container of dry quinoa and a gallon Ziploc bag of muesli bar. Even the board where Dad scribbles Scoob's daily instructions is gone. Every trace of Scoob seems to be erased. It's like he never even lived here. Dad, he sh shouts then, tripping over his n not even solid feet as he makes his way back to the living room. Dad, please hear me. I'm so sorry, Jimmy, Dad says. His body isn't moving, but his mouth is. Though it's not his voice, it's Gmaw's. What? Dad, it's me, Scoob. It's William. Dad, your son. I did the wrong thing, but I'm going to make it up to you, Jimmy. Dad says in Gma's voice again, turning to look at Scoob this time. Well, through him, apparently. Scoob stumbles back. Dad's eyes are pure white. No irises or pupils or anything. We're already past where you and I got to before, William and me, Dad continues. You would just love William to pieces, Jimmy. He's the best grandson there is. Reminds me of the best parts of you. Dad rises from the chair with a pillow in hand and walks towards Scoop. D D Dad, what, what are you doing? Scoop stumbles backward and falls as Dad advances on him, pillow held at the edge of both hands. He leans over and lowers, his, lowers it towards his son's face. Scoop squeezes his eyes shut. I just, I hope you'll forgive me one day, Jimmy, Dad is saying. I'll never forgive myself, but I hope you'll forgive me. I'm going to make it this time. And I'll do what we planned. And then you'll forgive me. Dad! The sound is muffled. Scoop can't breathe. 
He twists and kicks and flails, and when he finally manages to inhale, his eyelids snap open and there are tears running down into his ears. He bolts upright, desperately thirst thirsty and wanting to go to Dad, but smacks his head on the low ceiling of his bunk. Ow! He shouts. Jimmy! Comes Gma's voice from the other end of the RV. Jimmy, are you all right, Jimmy? The sounds trail off as soon Scoob is hearing her soft snores again. He breathes in deep and tries to get his heart to slow down, holds his hands up to his face, and he can tell they're solid now, even though it's dark. He's got to pull it together. It was just a dream, Scoob. You're fine. Wait, it's dark. Scoob flips to his belly to look out of his small window. Again, a bajillion and one stars. It was just creeping into dusk when he fell asleep, which means, what time is it? He moves to climb down and check, but something crunches beneath him. One of Gma's roadmaps. It all comes tumbling back into his head then. Contraband and Gma acting weird and piles of money behind the TV. Gma's missing phone. Scoob swallows hard. He really wishes he had some water. And blinks back, a wave of, well, he's not exactly sure what. A few things hit him at once. He's trapped at some campground in Mon Monroe, Louisiana, according to the map, without which he would have no idea where the heck he is, with no phone and no idea when he's going home. And he really, really misses Dad. Like, more than he's ever missed anybody. Especially after that horrible dream. Though, what he can do about it, Scoob doesn't have a clue. He sighs and lies back down, imagines the tire swing behind g old house, and playing with Shanice on it, then drifts back to sleep.